And next we have Director of the Centre of Healthy Longevity, Singapore National University Health System, Dr. Andrea Mayer, um, to see what she has to say about evidence-based interventions to prolong health and lifespan. Please. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, for, thank you for spending time uh, with us. I think time is the most valuable and we cannot buy it yet. Uh, hopefully we can live longer. But I think spending the time and quality is, is most important. So thank you for the invitation to speak here. I'm Andrea Meyer. I'm um, living and working at the National University. I'm not working, I'm not living at the National University of Singapore. <laughs> this is really nonsense. Sorry, I just had a flight from uh, the US and I really have no clue how, how, what the time zone is in here. But I am working at the National University of Singapore um, and it's, it's fabulous. Uh, it's a fabulous time where we not only understand why we age and we fixed mice, they are living 30 or 50 percent longer, but we now can also measure the biological age of individuals, of humans, and we can treat them. And now we are in a time, in a time zone, where we implement it into clinical practice. And everybody around the world is so enthusiastic, as Evdina Bishop already said, we are not only now implementing private clinics, but we are also implementing public clinics. And I think this is really going to revolutionize how we uh, take care of healthcare. So we are making healthcare much, much, much more healthier. I have a couple of disclosures. I work um, for a couple of companies and also founded my own private clinic, G Longevity, where we provide evidence-based, tech-enabled health and longevity clinic. And I'm also the chief medical officer of, uh, of NU. And I'm very proud that I am allowed to work and advise the WHO. And as Evelyn already mentioned, Professor Bischoff, we have the Health and Longevity Medicine Society. Um, I'm in the field since roughly 20, 25 years, and this is so exciting that we now have an ecosystem. And I will showcase you the ecosystem we established in Singapore. I think it's quite unique because we are bringing preclinical research together with clinical research. We are bringing it into clinical practice. And what we have to achieve in the next coming five years, we have to bring it into public health because everybody is aging, so nobody is escaping at the moment, even not the biohackers in the room next door. So everybody is aging, and there was 100% if you want to call aging a disease or the symptoms being related to aging, um, then everybody has it. So that's the reason why we have to bring it into the public health sector. I'm very fortunate that uh, I'm working together with Professor Brian Kennedy. He is uh, leading the preclinical team. I'm leading the clinical team, and we have lots of other PIs who are helping us in establishing this ecosystem. We have two main goals, and that is really finding good biomarkers for aging, so really diagnosing how old we are and tracking it longitudinally. And of course, it would be really unethical just knowing that I would be younger or older, whatever, without intervention. So we are really looking for interventions. It's very important, because our field is so new, that we also bring education to the field. And that's the reason why we, five months ago, founded the NUS, the National University of uh, Singapore Academy for Health and Longevity, where we bring lots of education to the place. And my last slide today, um, so get already your, your phones out for scanning a QR code. We have an intensive course in the end of February and also a supplement conference to really educate not only clinicians and uh, clinician scientists and scientists, but also regulators, which is very important, and really bringing them into our ecosystem. You already saw this one, um, so it's your second chance to scan uh, the QR code. The Health and Longevity Medicine Society is, I think, the real stepping stone to bring it into clinical practice. Very often, and I had it on my LinkedIn profile, we say we are health and longevity medicine physicians. This is not true. It does not exist. Because it's not being regulated by any society around the world, by any government. It does not exist. So that's what we are really striving for, to get me and Professor Bishop and, and lots of you in the room who are clinicians 
to the stage that we can say yes, you are a certified health and longevity medicine physician. We also are aiming to write lots of guidelines that we bring quality to the field that we can also say this is good care and this is maybe not so good care and we want to have worldwide trial networks because the time is ticking at this moment in time. Let's do very, very big trials with clinically meaningful outcome parameters, go back to the biology and understanding why certain interventions work and why not. Very often we are talking about health spend and you already saw that the Health and Longevity Medicine Society wants to optimize health spend. Six weeks ago I got a phone call from the Secretariat of the Ministry of Health in Singapore because they, sh they saw a Netflix series where Singapore was called a blue zone, 3.0, and I got the question, Professor Meyer, what was health spend? And I said, hmm, that's easy. That's a time until you have the first chronic disease, which is age-related. So, hmm, this is not how we calculate it. We're doing it via the health-adjusted life expectancy, ill. And I said, hmm, I thought that we are entering the sick span time and not entering anymore the health span if we have the first chronic disease, so roughly at the age of 50. However, the government has quite different analysis when we are entering the sick phase. And it's roughly in Singapore at the age of 75, whereas the lifespan is 85. So the gap is quite narrow. And then last week, we um, announced, Jamie Justice, the X Prize. And it's the X Prize for health spend, $101 million dollar if somebody in the room and around the world is going to make lots of people biologically younger on brain, immune and muscle health. And I asked Jamie, Jamie, you have an X prize and it's health spend. What is health spend? And she said, hmm, I do not know. So we did a systematic review already a little bit earlier to actually with the question, what is health spend? And we looked at the entire literature, we um, got 15,000 articles, articles who used the word health spend, and at least defined it in a couple of words, lifespan being measured by, for example, of lifespan is, and these were included. We included 207 out of these 15,000 articles, and what the result is that we found 187 different definitions of health span. And we found 113 records, which are really primary definitions, so 113 different definitions how we define health span. And out of this 187, there was one from Matt Caroline, published in 2018, which was 13 times cited and four times without any modification. So what does that mean? We have really no idea what kind of terminology we use. So it's very important for our field that we make sure that we know if we are using certain terms, that we know what to do. So last Tuesday we were in, uh, at the Buck Institute, so we had the first round table discussion, bring people together, defining first, do we have to define health span? And we said, oh yes. And now we have working groups to define health span. Because otherwise we cannot compare the literature. What we do in clinical practice and also in research, we always have, as I said, diagnostics versus interventions. This is a nice framework, I like it. And this is also the framework in terms of def uh, definitions, what, what a biomarker of aging is, that we are looking at biological markers, we are looking at clinical markers, and we are looking at digital markers. To so think about methylation for the biological ones, clinical, look at the fear to max, and the digital ones look about, look, um, for example, at sleep, sleep quality, heart rate variability, etc., etc. And on the other hand side, which is quite nicely connected, we have the interventions, which are lifestyle interventions, environmental interventions, very important, but also supplements and therapeutics, for example, repurposed drugs. 
I would like to first talk a little bit about the biomarkers of aging because last Monday, also at the Buck Institute, we had the first roundtable discussion and meeting about the biomarkers of aging consortium. These are the people behind it. Um, I would really draw your attention to the executive committee because these are the postdocs and senior postdocs who are really driving this consortium and you are just incredible. So if you want to know something about the consortium, don't, don't ask this, the seniors, ask, ask these uh, people, especially uh, Mani Mokri is doing a fantastic uh, job. What is our roadmap? So what do we want to achieve? The first paper we wrote defining a biomarker of aging. What is it? Getting the terminology right, which is very important. The second paper, which has now been accepted, is really how can we validate biomarkers of aging? What is the, the lowest standard of validation or what is the top standard? And the third one is, okay, how can we bring validated biomarkers into clinical practice? And that's in the making. There will also be lots of challenges and a little bit of competition. Sometimes competition is good. Who has really the, the best biomarker of aging? And it will be announced uh, very, very soon. So the first question we ask ourselves is, do we know what a biomarker of aging is? And here you see the definition out of the Delphi methodology um, route, which is something very important that we now know what a biomarker of aging is. And it is um, a quantitative parameter, so you can measure it, of an organism that either alone or in composite predicts biologic and ideally it changes in response to interventions. So we have to measure something, it has to be hopefully responsive, and so important we can quantify it, and there we can track it over time. Here you also see that we have three different levels of what biomarkers can do. They can predict, they can be responsive, and they can be surrogate markers. So always in my clinical trials, I look for surrogate markers, which are also responsive biomarkers. So think about a CIP. CIP is absolutely changing over time, and is also a surrogate marker for example, for cardiovascular disease. And we can borrow these kind of markers now for our field. So look for surrogate markers if you want uh, to do randomized controlled trials. The second paper here is just one of the figures where we really looked, okay, what is the validation? What is the minimum standard? Uh, look at the publication that will be in Nature Medicine very soon. But most importantly, we also made a list of all the cohorts available who either already have omics uh, data and clinical data, but who also have long-term outcomes, for example, the incidence of disease or mortality. So that's very important. Um, so look uh, uh, at that paper certain times. We also wanted to really look at biomarkers of aging, which are clinical, which are already used for, possibly, in clinical practice to see if we can determine and risk stratify individuals in the bigger cohort which might have a risk of age-related diseases later on. So this uh, paper is published in uh, Nature Medicine a couple of months ago, where we really looked at the UK Biobank at all clinical data, and we made a body block, and we made several organ-specific blocks. And our question really was, can we predict mortality, and can we predict the incidence of disease? And the, the answer is yes, absolutely we can do it. Which means if you are just looking at the markers here, it's very, very easy for every GP. Every GP can measure lung function, can measure the, the heart rate, can measure the blood pressure, can measure an MMSE. So it's very um, uh, important already to bring these kind of biological markers into clinical uh, care. Here you see the predictive capacity of this body clock for predicting incidences of diseases, which you can see here in the, in the circle. Somebody, for example, at baseline with no disease, all healthy, um, had, for example, already a four-year higher biological age compared to the one uh, who had uh, an incidence of COPD compared to the one who, uh, who did not uh, in the end. So it's, it's quite nice that we already have markers we, which we could uh, implement, which we are also doing in the valid study uh, in, in Singapore into, uh, in the NGP practices, but now really showing if this is also valid in an Asian population. But also very nicely is that we did analysis to look at the sequence of the occurrence 
of age-related decline in function of the human body in different organ systems. And that's what you can see here in our network analysis, really showcasing in healthy individuals after a sequence of a follow-up of six years and another six years, that individuals who are declining in the pulmonary function are very likely to decline in their cardiac function. And after the cardiac function is going to decline, it's very likely that these individuals also decline in their renal function. But we also now know if it's a one-way street or in both directions. For example, if you look at pulmonary function, it's very likely that somebody decreases in the cardiac function, but not vice versa. And for clinicians, this is very important because a cardiologist should therefore not refer to a pulmonologist, but a pulmonologist should refer to a cardiologist. So now it makes a little bit sense. And of course, this is just one data analysis, but we should use all our uh, EMRs uh, and all the data in it in, in this way that we can predict what's going to happen. In clinical practice, we already use biological uh, markers, biomarkers of aging. And what we are really doing now is getting grip on how we interpret them and also link them to interventions. And this is happening in all health and longevity clinics around the world at the moment. And what you can see, for example, in this individual, that there's a huge variety of biological ages uh, in the end. Uh, we also have to get grip on all, all omics approaches, and that's what we are doing with NU, where we are really looking at the genetic, the epigenetic, and the microbiome, for example, and within individuals, how that relates to each other to build digital twins. And I think having, in the end, a digital twin in clinical practice and then really looking at what kind of intervention we can, we can assist with, that's very important. We also do lots of uh, clinical assessments because just the biological assessment is absolutely not good enough, in my sense. Knowing how much senescent cells you have in the brain is good, but how the brain functions is even better. So you always have to really adapt and complement it with functional testing and imaging uh, and testing. But also, looking at functional testing, what you can directly use for interventions, that's very important and that's what people are looking for. Here is just one example, and it's a random example, looking at continuous glucose monitoring systems where we really track our patients, what they eat, and then 24-7 and in real time, and where our healthcare coaches really give, give advice directly to the patients, hey, you have a spike, what did you eat? Can we change this tomorrow? And we also give challenges by giving pizza, and by making cookies and bananas, etc., to really see when people spike uh, in terms of their, their glucose level. So I think this is really the next level of good care, that we give feedback directly to the individual. We also look at the genome, and I think this is the, the next, again, uh, sequence of, um, of, of good, good care. But we can really tailor not only nutrition interventions to the gut microbiome, which is now feasible, but also on, on the genome. So we have now a library to link not only the intake and blood levels, but also a link it to, uh, to the genome. And of course, now we are entering a phase where we can use nutraceuticals or supplements or even food, where we really direct individuals because we know what the biology of aging is. We have, for example, we know that there are senescent cells, we have senolytics and we have cinnamorphics. Where can we find these kind of ingredients in the food? Or we can challenge the body with nutraceuticals and with, with supplements. So we do lots of work at the moment to really see if we can create the healthiest food with a little tiny bit of supplements to get, for example, rid of uh, senescent cells. At the moment, we do lots of research um, on supplements, on specific supplements, because there is not much knowledge around there. There are not many randomized controlled trials. Just giving you here one example, the glutinamide mononucleotide, there were lots of talks already this morning, and I think they, they will also continue um, this afternoon, showcasing that if we are exposing individuals who are healthy and middle aged, 600 and, uh, sorry, yeah, 600 and 900 milligram of uh, uh, NMN, 
really improves in a very tiny trial, only 20 individuals per arm, but it improved the quality of life and the, the walking speed of individuals. But most importantly, not look, looking at the clinical parameters, we were also able to show that, of, that the MED levels actually increased and that at 600 and 900 milligram, there was a plateau of MED level increase. That was the primary outcome of this trial, but most importantly for me as a clinician, it's much, much more important who were the responders and the non-responders in this trial, and can we actually see which people have the highest propensity of a positive clinical outcome parameter with what kind of NED change. We did lots of support, um, subgroup analysis, and we were able to show that was a 50 nanomil per liter increase in uh, NED levels with our SA. We had the highest chance that individuals had a clinically meaningful outcome parameter. And I think this is the next generation again of doing health and longevity medicine. Like we would normally do in internal medicine, you are measuring glucose, you are giving insulin, you are measuring glucose again. So the same we are applying here, we are measuring NED levels, we are looking at the change while giving NMN, and we are measuring NED levels again. And this is really towards precision health and longevity uh, medicine. We do the same for alpha ketoglutarate. We have a couple of trials now in different populations ongoing. Alpha ketoglutarate is really known to change how it's doing, we do not know, but it's, it's absolutely changing the epigenome of individuals positively. That's also the reason why we are doing the first human trial where we are giving in healthy individuals AKG to individuals who are not only healthy but have a higher biological age based on their epigenome using four different blocks using the median of these four different blocks. So this is the first study where we really risk segment individuals, healthy individuals, possibly to their needs because they have a higher methylation uh, age and giving a supplement which hopefully is going to change that. So watch out, um, the uh, inclusion is, is done and they are now in, um, in months two to four of uh, their treatment. Very important, also other supplements, we are um, at the moment uh, designing a trial for glycine, very important. Uh, glycine has not so many side effects, there are a couple of studies already out, please have a look at this, uh, this publication uh, a couple of weeks ago in GeroScience where we really looked in a very systematic way if glycine had effect of different um, organ systems and physiological system in humans and that's what we always do. We want to know if that drug or the supplement has an effect throughout all the organ systems and we are analyzing that quite, uh, quite nicely. Another publication which will be out next week in um, the Lens and Health and Longevity, we did the same. We, looking, we are looking at what kind of evidence in humans do we have using rapamycin and rapalox. Again, we are using the systematic approach, not only looking at physiological parameters, but all organ functions. And what you can see here is not much known. Um, all in green are positive outcome parameters, and as you would expect for rapamycin and rapalox, um, there is a positive effect on the immune system. But you see that lots of the organ systems are not even studied. And that's also the reason why my lab really focused on building the, the SOPs, the standards operation procedures, how we are measuring different organ systems in middle-aged uh, individuals. And we are starting the longer trial very, very soon. It's a fourth um, rebuttal uh, with the ethics, and we are nearly, uh, nearly there. This is my last slide, so now your, your cameras really should be pointed towards um, the QR codes. We have three days of an intensive course, uh, which is a very different style of education where we do lots of interviewing with our superheroes, which are all coming to, to Singapore in the field. And then we have at the third day, we have workshops. One of the workshops is going to longevity clinics. And then we have two days just about supplements because we need to understand this powerful tool um, in geroscience in health and longevity medicine, how to use them, who to use them, and hopefully also as a result of this conference, we have, have big trial networks uh, in the end, and we are working together. Thank you so much for your attention.
然后提问的观众请直接起立。May I ask who's taking supplements here in the room? Hands up. Nobody. <laughs> Nearly nobody. You are not representative, I think. <laughs> Vera is. Yes. I am taking supplements, <laughs> but questions. Well, you know, I have lots of questions we can probably discuss afterwards. You know, I guess one question is how to prioritize, right? So with what strategy to be used? Because there are, especially from traditional medicine, there are some supplements that, well, there are probably thousands yeah. of years that suggest that they do something. It's not exactly modern standard evidence based, but uh, there is some evidence, generational evidence. So, like, what you have this big task ahead of you. How are you going to prioritize? Yeah, we, we are prioritizing as we normally do in clinical practice. You are starting in, in medical practice normally one drug by the other and you're, you're measuring the effect. And I think our field has to learn that we are measuring. And very often this is not being done because in the market there are already lots of supplements which are just blended, so lots inside of something. And how do we know how these are interfering with the helmets of aging or with mechanisms which interfere with our bodily functions? So we do not know. So very important clinical practice, and I can just talk how I do it. We're giving a supplement at least for, for a couple of weeks and months, and we are measuring what we, what we think to interfere with. And then we are starting another one. And it's the same as we would do um, in an in an outpatient clinic treating uh, hypertensive individuals. You're starting one drug, you're giving another, it's trial and error, and you're giving another. And you're measuring, not you are not asking how are you doing, no, you're measuring the blood pressure. And that's what we have to establish. Andrea, yeah, yeah, very nice, uh, very nice talk. I wonder, now with this ever-increasing diagnostics that are done in your clinic and in probably many new places around the world, What's your view on um, the usage of these, uh, of these diagnostic data in discovery science? Because there's so much now that we could learn about aging in humans um, based on all these measurements if there's a lot of standardization metadata provi provided and all these things that could be used for, for discovery science. Absolutely. I think there, there's a huge opportunity and lots of companies and startups are already are doing that in humans and, and using these biomarkers. The only caution I have, I would say, is rubbish in, rubbish out. I can tell you we, in the, in the longevity clinic, in the private and the public one, we, we measured so much and now we already kick biomarkers out because they do either do not make sense and it doesn't mean that they are not useful, but then let's stay in research. Um, or they're absolutely not reproducible. So if this is the reason why I really love the initiative of the Biomarker of Aging Consortium. Please go to their website. It's, I think, uh, if you Google, you cannot Google here, uh, Biomarker, <laughs> Biomarker of Aging, you will find it. And please text me, I'm on WeChat, uh, if you want it. Because we have one button and that's uh, participate, or I want to participate, I want to be integrated, and then you get newsletters, etc. So that's very important, to measure the right thing at the right time and the right human beings. I think my time is really up. <laughs> Can I ask last, one question? Last question. Okay, so yeah. uh, I was quite interested that you mentioned about continuous glucose monitors. So the best way to keep your glucose flat, of course, is to massively increase your intake of fat. And I wonder whether we're kind of hobbled a little bit by the technology that's available, because if we had continuous fatty acid monitors, then you might have a very different message about how you should manipulate your diet. So I just, I just wonder if you have any thoughts about that kind of partial information yeah. that we're, we're basing recommendations just on part of the total picture. Yeah, and absolutely. So I think we are in the toddler space at the moment in our field, where we are now having a monitor and measuring glucose, but we also have the lactate monitors and keto monitors, etc. And we have to learn how to do it. Very importantly, the first thing is finding the most, whatever that is for that client based on the genome, appropriate diet, and then working together with the client in the glucose monitoring, where you can avoid, uh, for example, in the same food groups, the spikes. 
And I already, I, I'm measuring myself very often. Within one food group, I have very, very different glucose spikes or glucose um, uh, changes in individuals. And very importantly, um, Mark Snyder, for example, has lots of research in it. It's so intra-individually determined um, that you have to measure before and before really aligning it with an optimal food, having lots of nutrients, lots of vegetables, and then the vegetable groups, etc. It's much, much more than the recommendation that WHO gives. And that's what we have to learn. And, and do not eat fat because you don't have a spike. Very unhealthy, don't do that. No, what, what spikes me is apples. But I don't think I should stop eating apples just because I get a spike of glucose because that's, that's what our system is supposed to do. You get glucose comes into your body, you release insulin and it packs it away into yourself. Sure, but we already know if you have a very, very a big spike that you are much, much more likely to have pre-diabetes or diabetes five years later. So what we are avoiding is not per se the spikes. I'm also a, a spiker, but I'm, I'm really, also my patients, if they're uh, spiking more than 10, then we would change the food. So what, what about the evidence that there's no repeatability in, in, in the spiking between individuals? So if you take one individual, like look at Kevin Hall's studies, for example. He studied people in a very controlled environment and gave them the same day on yeah. consecutive days and yeah. get a completely different result. Yeah. Yeah, and that really matters. I'm not sure if you control it for a physical exercise, etc. It compare. It really also matters in terms of the environment, and even even we sleep, we see that we also do these control trials. But maybe we can do that in terms of the time. I see very nervous people here on my left hand side uh, to talk in the in the break. Thank you. Just last one question. I think they're letting me ask this question. Uh, so you mentioned about, or you showed a picture of the organ clock. So you showed the picture of organ clocks, that was very impressive. You talked about the interaction, you talked about the directionality. Is there a hierarchy in the uh, different organs in terms of their aging? I, I think there is a hierarchy, um, but we cannot showcase that because these are just epidemiological data. Um, designing an experiment where you actually causally show it is very, very difficult. What we at the moment just see interrelationships of one function is going down first, another function is going down. If that's because of a third mechanism, we do not know. And um, the senescence network, um, uh, I, I do not know how this consortium is in the US, the senescence set, send net. I think will at least for the hallmark of aging senescence give us a little bit uh, of, of background because they are biopsy different organ systems and then show, or showing how much, for example, senescence load uh, there is. And of course we have to do that for, for all other organ, organ systems. So if it's the cause or the consequence, we, we do not know. That's Andrea Show. 下面有请复旦大学营养研究院。